Good morning and welcome back to the CDS Season 2 VOD Reviews. Today my name is Spitz, it's been that way for quite a while now, and we're going to go over our Week 6 games against Shador X, uh, or maybe maybe Sh Shadaux? Or, or Shadubi. Not entirely sure how to pronounce Shardox's name. My team in the Champion Draft Series, where we drafted our champions, is Gwen, Leona, Draven, Nilla, Kennen, Lucian, Sejuani, Kaisar, the Gangplank, and the King of the Poros. And Canadian Chime Slams, ran by Shardox, is on Victor, Alawi, Elise, Lux, Renekton, Annie Jin, Shen, and I forgot to update this. It is Lissandra. It used to be Tarek, and now it's Lissandra. Uh, so what will Shardox bring? Uh, I want to bring up that last season Shardox had a very similar lineup. Like, he's got a very similar lineup to what I had last season, right? So, like, he's got the Alawi, he's got the Shen, and he used to have the Tarek, right? And these are very, very similar. And if you want, you can even make a comparison between Gwen and Elise and Fiora and Lux. And so I think the way that Shardox is going into CDS Season 2 is very similar to how I went into CDS Season 1. Uh, and I mean, I still got similar trims to what I had last time. Like, I still have Gwen, and a lot of the logic that I used was very, very similar with stuff like Kennen and Lucian. So, I basically mentioned this, obviously, the Lissandra changes things. To say that, like, you can say that his only real deck is Annie Jin. Like, it's the only real deck that you can see. But just like what I could do last season, you can bring any region that you want. Sans Banal City and, I think, Targon. He doesn't have Targon access either. Uh, and has major flexibility and will... Like, very effectively leverage his regions um, with non-committal champions. Like, none of these champions really beget you too much. Maybe Lux is a bit weird in that she does cost 5 mana and she doesn't actually have, like, a play effect you need to sort of proc her with spells. Uh, every other champion you can slot into a deck and they're not going to be bad. They're statted well enough for what they do, or their keywords are good enough, blah 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 blah. So I could see Shardox bringing Annie Jin or Alawi Damasia or Alawi Ionia or Renekton Damasia or anything with SI, anything with PNZ, anything with Freljord, anything with Noxus, anything Ionian. Um, you don't, I'm not going to worry about like any Buildwater or any Damasia and they don't have as strong of region identities outside of like champion strength and Buildwater maybe having Make It Rain, but that's about it. But my point is that I, I don't think it's accurate to say that you can look at their champions and designate your method of beating Shardox purely based on his champions. Because you couldn't do that against me last season for very similar reasons, right? Uh, primarily all of these are leveraged for region choices as opposed to anything else. So in week one versus Grandpa Roji, Shardox brought Shen Lux, which is basically just Shen J4, Victor Tarot Cosmic Call, again, this was before the nerfs, and then Annie Jin, but this more control style list that you see here. Uh... It's interesting. I mostly just point this out to show that he's got very interesting deck choices that he messes around with, and he's not even going to use the champions in the way that you may expect them, even if they are more linear. In week two against Slay, which was another victory, uh, he brought Tarek Lux, which was a Sojourner's deck. Lux is again irrelevant, it's just a Sojourner's deck. Rekton Alawi and Annie Jin Control. I really like this list because I really love Mountain Sojourners, and adding the Divine Judgment is a super cool way of using Tarek. I just, I love this a lot. In week 3 versus Sir Termin, he brought Tarek Lux Sojourners again, as well as Shen Alawi and Victor Elise Mill. This is the Mill deck, there's a formula that my face is covering, but so be it. Week 4, uh, his enemy forfeited, they were asleep during week 4, so the game didn't end up getting played and they got the win from that. But in week 5 against FTP Bust, he brought Elise Lissandra, like buried in ice control, Victor Lux, which is just Jace Lux, except with Victor instead of Jace, and then Shen Alawi, and this is the Shen Alawi list, I've moved some of the cards around so you can see what all the spells are. Uh, basically, you can say that he likes Alawi and he likes Lux, like he brings those relatively often, but at the end of the day, none of those decks, like, repeated more than once, uh, sorry, repeated more than twice, and he is willing to do whatever he wants, right? The only stuff he hasn't really experimented with too deeply by this point is, like, Noxus as a region, as opposed to just Noxus as part of any gen. But that's about it. Like, I don't think you're allowed to write anything off of Shardox. Just like Cephalopod, uh, these two weeks, I think, of some of the most creative deck builders in terms of changing what they want to do for the enemy game they're about to fight. I think FTP Bust and L Games also do a rather similar thing, but Shardox and Cephalopod I know prior as people that really want to do that. And so, I didn't really have too much expectations going into this thinking I'm going to be X deck or Y deck. If I had Shardox's lineup, personally, I'd try things like Elise Victor or Renekton with Bilgewater or Demacia or an Alawi deck or Midrange with Freljord. Um, but you can even go even crazier. You could be testing things like Catalog Gohard or Feel the Rush C3 and Matron Ice Spawn Pyros. Uh, so what's to be done, right? Like, we've got all this background information. All I've said is nothing. I haven't actually said anything about what we're supposed to do with this. Uh, if I just play linearly good things that do well against 
something that probably is a mid-range win con, right? Like Renekton, Alawi, even Victor, even Elise and like Lux, all are sort of mid-range win cons. So as long as I'm okay against mid-range win cons, like I can't bring Shellfolk, right? Shellfolk's not good against mid-range win cons. Then I could probably do that. And what did we learn from last week where we lost against Cephalopod because we brought completely random nonsense is to just play good decks. Uh, so the first... Oh, sorry. I forgot about this slide. Um, one thing that I don't often articulate is that there's also just, like, what I want to play, right? Like, I could bring FTR, and I've never played FTR, and I don't really like FTR. FTR's not really my jam. But, like, I could bring FTR, and if it's the right thing, I will bring it, because that's how I view CDS as something that I'm trying to win via deck building in creative ways. Uh, but if I think about, like, what I want to bring... My favorite decks that I've got access to are like Red Gwen. I'd love to bring that again. I like Leona, and I haven't really played her that much outside of Leona Kennen once against uh, Grandpa Roji. Uh, I'm quite enjoying Kennen. Uh, Cephalopod pointed out that I brought Kennen every single week, and that was still true even when we fought Cephalopod. Uh, I haven't played with Nilla at all. I've built like four or five decks with her. I've just never played with her in the tournament. Um, and I've also been jamming the fuck out of Cythria Matron on Eternal Ladder, and I made it to Masters yesterday, running Cythria Matron as well as Sunburn, the Draven uh, Leona deck. Uh, so this is the first deck that I was thinking of bringing. It was Cythria Matron. This is an updated version from the version we brought last week. I talked about that updating process a little bit earlier. Some of the cards have been moved around. For example, when they're on 2-3 single combat, I think it's really premium to be able to play Spectral Matron and Cythria Lady of Clouds and still hold up any place of interaction for things like Atrocity. Uh, overall, this deck feels good. I don't think you need Islander. I think Islander's kind of bad. If you just play the deck slightly slower by controlling better, you won't need to have an Ephemeral unit. Uh, but Islander's also good for when it is great at comboing it. Uh, when doing Scrims, we did edit this a little bit. The version that we were testing for on Scrims was on three copies of Soul Harvest. If you look at Stardox's champions, Victor, Alawi, Elise, Lux, ignore Renekton, Annie, ignore Jin, Shen, and Lissandra, Seven out of nine died a soul harvest, and especially important ones like Renekton and Lux and Victor do, right? So I say Renekton, I meant Alawi. Alawi, Lux, and Victor. And so we were on three cups of soul harvest in this. In the end, we don't end up bringing this deck, but this is one of the decks that we we're playing with to begin with. Another deck, we'll, another deck we ended up bringing was Draven Leona. Uh, this is our version of it, teched for the matchup. I really like Morning Light, especially against Shardox. I think being able to. They don't really have ways of interacting with Morning Light, basically. You have to, like, kill Sunhawk on the stack or interact with Leona via a hush or something in order to deal with Morning Light. It's nothing they can really effectively deal with. And Morning Light, I just think, is bonkers. Like, it's pirouette and inspiring light in one card and can always be better than it if you've got a Leona on the field or a Sun Guardian on the field or something or a Twilight Protector to get a second uh, inspiring light. It feels really good. Sunburst also felt pretty good into things like Alawi. Everything else is relatively stock standard for this sort of deck list as far as I'm aware. Uh, I wanted to bring Plunder. Again, we're talking about linearly strong mid-range decks. I'm going to bring Plunder. Uh, and then when we ended up getting off uh, the Lucian Gwen, uh, P-Tash had, like, about an hour earlier, posted this deck list that was Nora Nilla, and it looked super, super, super fucking cool. And so I saw that and I was like, I, I can play this with Kennen and I really wanted to bring Nilla. And it sort of just lined up all perfectly. It was decent against the stuff we were testing against against Shardox. Like their Alawi lists don't run many units. So being able to play stuff like Mirai Warden or Portal Palooza or Portal Scholar beats when they just play like a one unit per turn action, right? So, Ken and Nilla ended up bringing the third deck. So, we were originally going to bring Lucian Gwen, but it ended up being Draven, Leona, Plunder, and Ken and Nilla. This deck plays out really fucking cool. If you don't immediately see it, you can play Portal Palooza on turn four, and then get your Slipstream from a Nilla that you attacked on turn two with, and you basically... I mean, you guarantee that you're going to get all your Portal units, because you get the one draw from Portal Palooza, you get your one natural draw leading into the next turn, and then you get your two draws from Slipstream. It feels really, really cool, and the open attacks you can do with Portal Scholar, Sneezy, Portal Palooza, Tide Dancer, it it feels really, really cool. And then obviously use Heroic Refrain if you've even got the mana to go over it. Basically, this deck is the most open attack deck ever that isn't running Moonlight Affliction. Or Moonlight Affliction, right? And this is also an open attack deck that runs Moonlight Affliction. Uh, this is different from Pete Tash's list. I did edit it a little bit. His version was on things like Group Shot to try and allow yourself to proc Tide Dancer on turn 6 if you need to. I decided that I want to go more into Sneezy and I can wait until turn 7 or turn 8. That's a much better line for me. But this was a very cool deck. I really enjoyed that I was able to bring this. And it was a very last minute change. 
Uh, their lists this week were Alawi Lux. This is just an Alawi deck. Uh, looks relatively stock standard. You will see three copies of Riptide Sermon because Pog Lux Synergy, I guess. And back to back and all these sorts of things. It's very light on units. And I want to point this out that Shardox's lists are very, very, very light on units. You'll notice. If you look at my lists, it's always more units than spells. This is the only deck that's sort of teetering on having a lot of spells. But it's okay because one of the spells is get two units, right? Compare this to Shardox's list where this has too many spells, this has too many spells, and this is its spell control. But it it's sort of a big thing you'll notice. And we need to go back to the old lists, right? All of these are extremely spell heavy outside of the, the Tarek Lux. And it's something that I noticed quite a bit when going through uh, Shardox's list. And especially Nass noticed this as well, um, who, I helped, who helped me scrim for this quite a bit. Anyway, the second deck was Renekton Shen. Uh... The best way I can explain this deck is that it's Akshan Yi, because it's a Glaive deck, and then you're just trying to combo that with things like Horns of the Dragon and Void A-Bomb, and Sonic Wave and Payday. Uh, I don't want to be the rudest to Shardox, but this list really need a grappling hook. Like, desperately. Like, it, it, it's sort of hard to explain how desperately this deck needs grappling hook. If I just play like portal scholar they can't kill it unless they challenge it uh there's there's a lot of issues with this deck list but it can do linearly strong things right like you can never let akshan yi just do its own thing because eventually it will win and do crazy stuff finally they had lissandra victor which is a elemental spam deck they're trying to run clash of giants which uh, i keep calling kiss a cutie um it's an interesting list I kind of like it. I'm a big fan of Yaskula. I mean, I ran a lot of Yaskula Deluge when the patch first dropped with the new champions. And it's all right, but as you can see, it's ratioed very weirdly. There's two harsh wins, one flash freeze, one brutal seal. That's it for freezes. It's got three mystic, three howling gale, two divine whirlwind, but only sunken temple and Mayim. It's not like there's Janna or anything. It's not like there's exalted cloudwinder. Uh, it, it's doing some interesting things. Flamecaller, Caprine, and Lissandra are really strong as tough units against my decks. But it, it's a very weird lineup. And when going into this, it was kind of hard to determine what to ban. If you look at my decks, it's pretty clear that they're going to ban Draven Leona. Uh, you could argue they're going to plan Gangplank Sejuani, but like Ken and Nil is obviously the odd one out. Like it's the weirdest deck, so you probably have to keep it up just because it may not be as linearly strong. And they're probably bringing, banning Draven Leona. So I'm looking at this and I'm seeing Renekton Shen... If it high rolls, I'm not the most scared of it because its high rolls look pretty weird. Like, its high rolls involve something like Eye of the Dragon and Forsaken Bekai's early blockers into Renekton plus Swinging Glaive, getting like the best keywords, and then somehow defeating me with Quicksand and Sonic Wave and blocking around a bit, right? And the high roll for Lissandra Victor is to play Mayim on two into Pioneer Lissandra on three, and then just like perfectly draw your Mystics and your Freezes and your Avalanches. And then eventually get Clash of Giants on like turns 8 and hope that it's enough. And their good draws against me involve no Sunken Temple. Like if they play Sunken Temple, they're going to spend 5 mana do nothing against my decks that really punish that sort of idea. The last deck that I had as an option to ban was Lux, but uh, Alawi Lux, which is linearly strong. But I think if it pops off, its pop-off is like, it, it's a known quality. Well, with these decks, I don't know exactly what known quality their pop-off is. We ended up deciding to ban Alawi Lux because it was the most real of all of these decks and the one that didn't look weirdest in the deck build, right? Like, this deck looks really weird in the deck build and Lissandra Victor looks really weird in the deck build, while this deck, while not how I would personally build this, I would have a lot more units. Um, it makes... It, it's not an awful way to have tried to build this list. Uh, at the end of the day, when going into the matchup, we were feeling pretty confident that we were going to do well, because we didn't really trust the way these decks were built too much, and we brought, like, three linearly strong decks in Draven, Leona, Gangplank, Sejuani, and Ken and Miller. Before we get into the games, there's just some quick updates I'm going to shove here. One, uh, Duck vs. Tron happened, I think, like, today, last week. Uh, I didn't end up playing because Tron won too well, and I was playing for Tron team, uh, and thus there wasn't any speed YouTube on it. I casted the APAC last chance qualifier last weekend with Boulevard. It was very cool. Boulevard's very fun to cast with. Uh, next week we play versus Sir Termond. He is the GOAT. It's maybe... Uh, I'm so excited. I fucking love Sir Termond. I've watched so many Sir Termond YouTube videos. Uh, 
you know, he makes me smile to just watch him play. It, it's the best. Um, so I'm so excited to be able to fight Sir Termin next week. That That's like a dream come true. Um, I went 5-2 in the open. I didn't end up playing fully in the open because I woke up late and then I had to cast, so I missed out on two hours. Uh, but I might make something on that soon because some of the games were rather interesting. And I brought an interesting lineup with decks that I hadn't played before. Like, I'd never played Band or Jin before I started the open. And Band or Jin ended up doing pretty well for me outside of my first game where I didn't know what the fuck I was doing. Uh, we're gonna try and do the VOD review style where I just pan over the game. We're not gonna play the games in full. I'm just gonna be moving the needle and explaining my plays. And finally, cheers to Ness for some aid. Uh, Ness and I scrimmed for about two hours before the tournament started, and then we did one scrim when we learnt the deck lists uh, before the game started. Uh, Ness definitely got me off C3 a Matron and made sure that I added good cards and didn't add bad cards. Uh, that was very, very nice of him. And Dolmont was also just hanging out with us, which was very, very cool. So thanks to those guys uh, for helping out with the match and the prep for this week in CDS. Let me go back to this page. Uh, that's all that I wanted to talk about. Uh, I hope you enjoy the VOD review portion. Uh, and that should be all. Goodbye and try not to die. Hey, just a quick note before we get into the games. Uh, my microphone and the recording is a little bit bugged. I don't have enough time to re-record the whole hour that's about to occur into your, your viewing experience. Uh, there's about like a collective minute over the course of the next 30 minutes of some like visual and audio glitches. I just wanted to put this here just so you know that it's not your device or anything, it's mine. Uh, one of them's actually quite funny in the way that it's timed, so I think it's actually kind of a good thing that it happened and it's left in. Uh, but just keep that in mind. I think it's because I've got uh, like the automatic green screen background blur that I was trying and I think it just overloaded my laptop like watching a YouTube video recording something and also trying to change the camera like in real time I think it just overloaded my computer so sorry about that but uh enjoy analyzing the games with me bye all right let's go over the games now uh this is gonna be some of the worst gameplay from my perspective I think I've done in quite a while. I'm not like a perfect tournament player, right? I'm not actually that good at Legends of Runeterra. I make a lot of very silly misplays very often. And in this best of three, I make about at least two game losing misplays, if not multiple, throughout a lot of the games. And so we're going to talk about them. We're going to see like why they're misplays, what I did wrong. A lot of them are just like lapses in judgment. Like I think of something that like I have to play around this card. Make sure you play around this card, Spids. And then I don't, like, I just don't do it. And it's, like, stupid, right? I should be playing around these cards. But nonetheless, uh, we're going to go through the games. And we're going to see what happened against Shardux. Uh, let's hit the play button. Uh, actually, no, we're gonna. I'm going to be scrubbing through it. I'm not going to be doing the play button. Uh, mostly because after about, uh, t like, 19 minutes, the entire commentary is me being like, Wow, Spids, you're not a good player. Wow, Spids, I can't believe you're making this play. Oh my god, you didn't even do this properly. Um, I don't deserve to win this best of three, which is true. I definitely don't with this play with these plays. Uh, but let's go through it. So they banned the the Draven Leona. I banned the uh, Alawi Lux, and we do this deck into this deck first. Which, if we've gone through the deck list, this should be a relatively good matchup. Uh, at least in my theory, like, their deck list is pretty awkward. They don't have too many freezes. They've got only, like, four, I think. They don't have too many pieces of interaction outside of the three Howling Gales. And their defensive units are rather light. Like, if I play Spirits Unleashed and I pressure them, I should just be able to win based off that. Now, they have a low tempo play in something like the, the Landmark. And that can only be recuperated if they have enough value in something like a Victor, right? If Victor gets the right keywords, like Fury, Tough, Lifesteal, Quick Attack, Spell Shield, uh, those sorts of things, Regen, uh, Victor is able to stabilize the board. And my deck doesn't really have a way of interacting with Victor outside of Sejuani's play effect. And then arguably Sejuani's level 2 effect in freezing Victor, but that requires you to be drawing certain things like Warning Shot and Make It Rain and Parlay and all these sorts of things. Uh, so in my head, this was a pretty favored matchup, but you'll see why I brought all of that up as we go through the games. Uh, we start off with the mulligan. Uh, let's let's hear this for a second. Uh, Murray Warren on two seems pretty good. Pill Kobe on three seems all right. I might cut. I might keep getting. What the fuck? I kept parlay. That surprises me. For they don't have anything parlayable is my memory. I'm surprised I kept parlay. Uh, that that really shocks me. 
Uh, so I should always kick Pali, right? I I've talked about how to play Plunder prior in, a, in a, like a very old Spids YouTube. But Parlay is definitely like one of the worst ways I have to activate the Nexus, especially against a deck that doesn't have X ones. I guess I'm thinking that I'm gonna Marai Ward them and then Parlay like a Mayim or something that they end up blocking with. But I don't really see too much value in keeping Parlay as opposed to keeping other units or trying to scry for extra champions or um, you know better better cards, right? Like Unleash Spirits or Second Marai Warden. I don't hate kicking Piltovi Castaway. His best play is always going to be on turn 3. Choosing whatever weapon you want to pressure on turn 3 is a lot better. Having the attack token on turn 4 means that Piltovi Castaway, while he's alright, I think I'd rather have most other cards in my deck compared to Piltovi Castaway. Swarm units for swarming, you know, Omen Hawk, or even like a warning shot or something. I think it's better than Piltovi Castaway right now. Now, one of the big questions is, should I have kept Gangplank? This is something that I was thinking about during the mulligan for quite a while. Gangplank is a very good card for pressuring, and I felt like their deck is going to struggle if I just have my good cards and they don't have their good cards. And their good cards are less plentiful than my good cards, because my, my deck is meta and their deck is not. Like, that's very, you know, uh, reductive, but that's sort of one way of looking at it. And so I decided to keep Gangplank, but I think... I think that's wrong, especially if I'm going to keep Parley. I feel like I'm only allowed to keep one of those cards, and Gangplank is better, but I could also just mulligan both of those away and try and find things like a Jagged Butcher on turn one. Not even to Plunder Procket, just to have three units on turn one. What, for extra Marai Wardens, or for Unleash Spirits, or for any of these things. So I really dislike my mulligan. I think I would have preferred a mulligan that looked like this, keeping only Marai Warden, getting rid of all of these three cards. Just because I think all of these three cards don't pressure enough in a matchup where I definitely do want to be pressuring early, so that on the later turns I can just try and overwhelm them for victory and not have to worry about too much because they're already scared because of the pressure that I've done previously. Like, they've already had to use their resources then. Alright. Let's move on. Uh, ooh, this is gonna get... Oh, I remember how I used to do this. Sorry, it's, it's all coming back to me now. I used to hit the H key and then I used to do this to go forward and back. There we go. Alright. Um... We end up drawing the Unleashed Spirit, which is quite nice because this is a very important card for us being able to value at later on. And Zap Spray Fin is okay. It, it'll be a 3-3 by the time you play it, which is not an easy set line for them to interact with outside of like a Divine Whirlwind, which they can't cheapen too easily. And it can draw our stuff, but it is a relatively slow hand, right? The only actual proactive play that we're doing that applies any amount of pressure is Mirai Warden. And as you will have seen, Mirai Warden gets pretty easily countered by Mystic Shot Mayan. This is something that I wasn't really thinking about them possibly having both of those cards at once. Like they, this is their early aggression defense. Like this is what they're trying to mulligan for. But I expected maybe one, but not both. Uh, and them having this really put us back quite a bit. And you could honestly argue that just from my mulligan and this play is, spoilers, why we lose this first game. Uh, there are plays way later on that are also why I lose this game. But part of what Plunder really wants to do against a deck that's this sort of like, you know, backline champion keep all your units around and eventually outvalue out me deck, which is what Shardux is running, right? He just wants to keep his victor alive and keep his landmark alive and just outvalue me. Uh, the best way for him to be able to do that is to get rid of any and all early aggression and any of all unit-based plunder procs, because one, killing the units means they're not going to proc plunder in future, and two, it means it's not doing nexus damage, it's not threatening a lethal. And with our hand being really, really slow, partly because of the mulligan, right? Two of these cards in our hand are bricks, because they're not doing anything for us until turn five or turn six or something. Uh, really shows like how a Miss Mulligan can fuck you up and how them having a really good early turn against our really bad early turn can fuck us up. Uh, I end up playing Parley here to proc the Nexus, try and be mana efficient. We, I end up playing Unleash Spirits over Zap Sprayfin, trying to also be mana efficient. I think you're allowed to play Zap Sprayfin here in theory, but if Zap Sprayfin gets Mystic Shot, I'm put really far behind, and I really wanted to have the Unleash Spirits played, especially if I can curve it into Mirai Warden and actually get some damage proc. Because Mirai Warden into Gangplank into Sejuani does not actually seem like that bad of a curve to me for just trying to apply genuine overwhelm pressure. Their deck doesn't really do well against big, well statted units, except with. Uh, Howling Gale, and even then Gangplank and Sejuani are relatively high in health, and they only have four cards in their hand, right? They're not actually doing a lot, uh, or they're not gonna have that much value. Go through a couple of turns, this is when I decide to play Gangplank, saying I'm just gonna pressure in. Now, this Gangplank is definitely curious. Partly because of this Fury keyword, right? Fury will proc off the, the keg, which means that Victor will end up being a 5-5, five five, and by next attack token, when they're going to play the, the thing, unless they play Sejuani, uh, Victor is going to be like a 6-5 minimum, and we're also going to lose our keg, which sucks, because I would want to use that keg to deal Nexus damage in theory. 
So there's an argument to not play Gangplank, but I don't think it's better to not have played Gangplank compared to playing these things. I hope that sentence worked. I'm quite tired. Uh, Gangplank, just with this stat line being an overwhelm unit, especially with the other Gangplank in hand, is going to be quite good for trying to pressure what I think is our main method of winning the game, which is just playing, like, Alpha Wildclaw two turns in a row. Uh, compared to playing something like this, I just feel as if it's not pressuring enough effectively enough. And I don't think the plus one plus one is as big of an issue... Uh, based on, like, what they're actually protecting Victor with. So Juani is currently a 6-7, which means that currently Sky Splitter already defends Victor against Sejuani pulling her, and getting the extra Fury proc won't affect that too, too much in the short term. In the long term, with Tuff or with Regen, it could end up being rather relevant, but in the short term, it isn't. So I do like playing the Gangplank. I think I'm going to stick by saying that the Gangplank was a good play despite them doing this. I can't pass because they're going to pass back. I can't really accept that. But, like, because I need to be applying pressure. So I definitely like playing the Gangplank. I can see why someone would hate it because you lose the keg and Gangplank on the field early without being flipped out and being able to be killed from Mystic Shot based inner LPNZ based interaction can be scary, but I don't know if I'm allowed to play Zap Spray Fin or, or this unit instead. Anyway, I play Gangplank into Sejuani. Uh, they pull the keg, they play Mayim. I try and kill Victor and I pull like this. They end up having Sky Splitter, or Harsh Winds, sorry, I think. So this is one of their freeze cards in Harsh Winds. They block rather favorably, and then that goes in the next turn. That's okay. I have to get Harsh Winds out of them if they've got it. So getting it out relatively early while also having units that I still want to be developing, especially on turn 7 because I've got the turn, the 4 mana card and the 3 mana card, curving into things like uh, Parlays is not too bad. This is, out of all of the Harsh Winds that could have occurred, I, I have to be happy to accept this. They do this, I take uh, Combat Reel over Shepherd's Authority. You can make arguments that I am supposed to take Shepherd's Authority, but I really wanted to threaten blocking Victor. And as far as I'm aware, this unit does threaten blocking Victor, because otherwise Victor could attack. Now, this is probably short-sighted. I think if Victor attacks... Uh, no, if they've got a Flash Freeze, I'm not allowed to block with the Gangplank. So Victor may be able to attack. So maybe I'm supposed to take uh, Shepherd's Authority anyway. Shepherd's Authority, uh, there's very few things that I want to block with, and adding the extra two health when this unit dies to something like a Sejuani or a Gangplank is definitely valuable. And I don't think I'm at the point where mana really matters, especially with my deck that isn't mana intensive and doesn't actually have any combat tricks. I'm not on Three Sisters, I'm not on FTR or anything. I don't think I'm on Sky Splitter either. So getting the spell mana is like entirely irrelevant for my deck outside of threatening a Make It Rain, which my deck is going to be able to do if I press, if I play properly anyway. I don't need the extra mana from Combat Reel. So I think I probably misplayed by not taking Shepard's Authority. I wanted to deny Victor from attacking me, but either Victor won't attack me anyway because they would rather have this lifesteal on the field and Sidwani's not close enough to leveling up for them to care. Uh, I also just don't... Th yeah. Uh, there's no value in Combat Reel, right? And I thought the value was that I wanted to be able to block if they attacked. I just don't think that's true. I don't think that's necessary. So I should have taken Shepard's Authority there, I think. They end up playing Temple, and this is what I was talking about. Temple is, like, in theory, my opening to trying to win the video game, but when they've got a Victor that is so... It's got everything, every keyword they want right now, right? Fury, Tough, Lifesteal, and Spell Shield. Spell Shield's mostly irrelevant. Uh, is basically exactly all they need right now, and combine that with any Flash Freeze, and it shuts down my attacks quite easily. I think I parlay this unit to try and level up my champions faster, but they're still no way, like, they're not going to be leveled up by the next attack token. Uh, they end up killing this unit via Aftershock. Is this Howling Gale? No, Divine Whirlwind. And so I have to make a decision, and this is something that I think Nas pointed out a little bit, is that I could have equipped Combat Reel onto another unit if I wanted. My thinking was that I wanted to diversify my attacking threats. They're going to try and interact with one of them via things like Lissandra's Entomb or Flash Freeze or even PNZ-based interaction. And so diversifying my threats seem to be valuable to me. I'm going to be attacking in with all my units, hoping that they're going to trade into Gangplank so I can play second Gangplank. Otherwise, Sejuani is just going to go in, so be it. Um, you could argue that I'm not supposed to attack with Sejuani in case they do this trade, make it positive, and then I don't have a Sejuani, so I can't freeze in future. But I think I'm supposed to just 
rip it and ship it. I think it's sort of hard to justify being super defensive against a deck that wants to Howling Gale my Sejuani. And even if I equip this with Combat Reel, Howling Gale plus like Mystic Shot is relatively in their range over the course of the next like three turns. Right? Um, and if I've got Fury the North in hand for second Sejuani, it doesn't matter if Sejuani is alive or dead because I'll have another Sejuani, right? So whether I'm playing Fury the North on Sejuani or playing second Sejuani, it's the same thing, right? So I don't have to worry about that other way of buffing up Sejuani. I put Combat Reel on this to diversify my threats. I think that's fine. They end up playing Mayim again. Um, why? Well, sorry, why did why did they get an action? Oh, I played Shell Shocker. I attack in with everything. They end up having a Sky Splitter, and they had the Faded on that unit. But I'm glad they killed Gangplank because I had taken Gangplank in hand. This is a relatively good turn for me compared to what could have been, right? They could have killed Sejuani. They could have done a few other things. But again, there's this Victor who has Fury and Tough that I am incapable of killing. And my win con right now really is to go around them and try and threaten Lethal from multiple axes or kill their Victor and then try and get Lethal afterwards. If we take a look at more of like the macro of what's going on, they're going to have an 8-8 in a couple of turns. I really need to destroy these blockers so that I can threaten the Nexus. They're going. This Nexus doesn't say 15. This Nexus should really say something along the lines of like 32, if you include this, unless I can get Sejuani to pop off in really specific ways. And that is through leveling up Sejuani and getting it through cards like Entomb. And also making sure that Sejuani can't be Howling Gale. Now you could say, you know, I could have put this on to prevent from Howling Gale, but I think over the course of multiple turns, they would be in theory able to deal damage to this unit, possibly. You, you could argue that, you know, that percentage chance of Howling Gale plus another piece of burn is always going to be smaller than just the percentage chance of them having Howling Gale. And I should be playing for that little snivel where they have Howling Gale, but no other pieces of burn like Divine Whirlwind or, or Avalanche or... Mystic Shot or whatever, and by doing that I should put this on this, but I wanted to play for uh, more damage on this unit so that I could have diversified wind guns. I don't know what the best piece of logic is, but that's what I was going with. They play Scholarly Climber, they shuffle a bunch of things in. Now, I play Mirai Warden this turn, because I'm like, Pog, units. I love playing units. Uh, this is like a staunch misplay. Uh, I haven't identified that a big part of what I need to do is get rid of these blockers and part of that is making it so that the gangplank keg does two damage to all units upon attack and so when we get into uh well there's a few reasons when we get into and I'm gonna be moving around in the timeline a lot when we get into this turn Right, there was a lot that happened on the last one, we'll return back to it in a second. Uh, when we get into this turn, it is like critically important that these units are dying, so there's nothing ghost blocking, so I can actually threaten the Nexus despite these units' existence, right? That's pretty important. And I could have been able to see that ahead of time, and I am a, I should be willing to lose my Mirai Warden unit in order to get the Keg, right? The Keg is currently more valuable on my board. If we also go into like this possible top deck, I get really punished by playing Mirai Warden due to my top deck of this Unleashed Spirits, right? The world in which I don't have Mirai Warden played, and then I play Gangplank into Unleashed Spirits to destroy all of these units, and then still have the attack token on future, is a much better and more comfy world. And there's no real reason to play Mirai Warden. There's no, like, action concern or anything that I should be wary of. It's just me playing on autopilot, right? I'm not thinking critically about my board space. I'm not thinking... I'm not seeing Gangplank as a two-unit develop. I'm seeing him as a one-unit develop, which is just not... It's just not what Gangplank is. He has a two-unit develop when the keg is quite relevant in board states where there are units with two health that you want to be killing, like Lissandra. And destroying Lissandra is really important because their only real way of preventing Sejuani from flipping at or doing her effect at fast speed is multiple pieces of PNZ removal, such as like triple Mystic Shot, or Lissandra's in tomb. So threatening Lissandra is like of critical importance. I still have Parley in hand, right? There's like, even if I don't draw this spell, I should be trying to threaten Lissandra with these two cards at the same time. And I'm just not doing that because I'm not identifying that threatening Lissandra is a critical piece of my win con to prevent myself from being entombed. I'm thinking of entomb, right? This is what I was saying at the start. I'm identifying what my lose conditions are, which is entomb, but I'm not actually identifying how to make it such that I am doing the best into those lose conditions, such as trying to make sure I can keg kill Lissandra. I'm just not thinking about that properly, whether it's this lack of keg that I'm getting 
or trying to th remove their units and trying to threaten more damage that in two only destroys one unit and I'm still pushing in more damage sideways. Anyway, this is... Ah, uh, oh, right, no, not this turn. Sorry, it's actually a future turn. Uh, they end up trying to kill uh, Sejuani via pulling it and then doing Hailing Gale. If I'd put the weapon on Sejuani, I'm almost certain they would have been able to play one more of their cards and then do Hailing Gale anyway, so that math wouldn't have checked out as too important. Obviously, them spending a card is relevant because it means Sunken Temple does less. Them spending cards is important, and if their, card, if their hand is something like Hailing Gale and then two Kissa Cuties, uh, they can't kill Sejuani, which is nice, so there could be argument again for the weapon to put on Sejuani. But I don't think it's the right play. I just, I don't see that being as of critical importance. Anyway, get into the next turn. So Juani's dead. I decide to attack like just the Zaps Raven. I think about this a lot. Uh, do I want to kill Lissandra with Gangplank, but possibly lose Gangplank to a three sisters and lose the entire attack? Or just have Gangplank die to the thrall? And I think I end up answering no. Gangplank is too important to me, and I really want to play for a Lissandra. Like, I'm really not winning this game if I don't draw a Lissandra. So if I'm trying to play for that Lissandra out, I should just attack with Zap Spray Finn, get my little bit of damage in, just in case I top deck Lissandra next turn to prevent Victor from healing or something. The attack here is mostly irrelevant, right? If Lissa if Victor ends up life stealing it back, the attack doesn't matter an iota. But I think the least committal thing to do is just to attack with the Zaps Brave Finn. You know, if it forces resources out, which means they have less draws, so be it. If they want to do Entomb now to prevent damage, so be it. Uh, they end up doing nothing, they just take the damage because they can. Um, wait. Oh no, though, they do a Flash Freeze. Right, no, which is really good for me. They do another Flash Freeze. Uh, which means more of their, like, actual good pieces of interaction are gone, and it's costing cards in their hand. Anyway, we draw a Jagged Butcher. It does nothing. They do an attack like this. You can argue that I'm supposed to pop the keg so that they can't pull it with the Thrall. I don't think that's too convincing of an argument. I'd rather have this piling in hand so that I can proc the Nexus for Sejuani if that needs to be the case. I end up top decking Sejuani, which is, like, this is my out. This is how I win the game. I top deck a Sejuani and try and go in. So my aim here is to pull Victor... Make sure they're not going to entomb Sejuani so that the Victor and all of their units get frozen when I attack in. And if they entomb Sejuani, I want to make sure that Victor's still dying, right? That's the main thing, right? I play Sejuani. Victor gets vulnerable. I pull it to a unit that's able to kill Victor, such as Gangplank. There are two options for how the attack works. If the attack works in the best way for me, it's because they don't entomb, and so all my units are still attacking the Nexus, which means they're blocking and not trading into my units. Like, the Thrall is trading or getting blocked. Sorry, is blocking the Mirai Ward and they're still taking the damage, but not actually trading into it. And if they've got Entomb, I just have to make sure that when they Entomb the Sejuani, or whatever they decide to Entomb, if they either Entomb the Sejuani or Entomb in front of whatever Victor is pulling, it, it is as good as it can be for me, right? So if I pull something with, if I pull Victor with Gangplank and they Entomb Sejuani, uh, that's okay by me. Victor dies, Sejuani won't be able to do her thing she won't be able to trade into all the units effectively my marae ward and stuff will die but that's okay because i can redevelop my units and i'm not scared on board and if they pull the if they entomb the gangplank my sejuani still stays around i'm still threatening a bunch of damage and i'm able to do things such as warning shot the nexus if they try and attack me with victor again or so far so when i say i misplay a lot it's because my attack looks like this in the end uh i just wasn't thinking again i was thinking about entomb and i even if you look at how i align the blocks it's not the worst. Another line I can do is not attack with Sejuani. So, uh, I think... Look, I think this is the right thing. Just wait a second. You could also see... I do the right thing for half a second! And then I don't understand! I, I, I'm, I'm genuinely not thinking through these games, and it disappoints me greatly as someone that wants to play LOR well. Like, what I like about- or one of the many things I like about- I like LOR for a lot of reasons, but one of the reasons I like LOR is analyzing the game critically and thinking about what is the best line, right? That's like, the whole point of Spid's YouTube VOD reviews is to think about the game in an analytical way. So to see myself make this play, where it's so clear to me how to play around in Tomb now, and it doesn't even have to be within this game state. It's such an obvious fundamental aspect of how to play LOR. You split 
like the two options they want to entomb. They want to entomb in front of Victor and they want to entomb Sejuani. To split those apart, to make it so that their entomb is getting as least value as possible, it's either getting 80% value by getting rid of Sejuani or 60% value, like of best value, you know, entomb. Let's say it's like 120% of being able to get rid of Sejuani and the thing attacking Victor. You split that into half by putting the Victor in front of something else and having your Sejuani somewhere else. It's such like a fundamental thing about how LOL works. It's not just entomb, it's with flash freeze, it's with, you know, freaking, I don't know, uh, whirling death, right? There are so many examples of making sure you're not attacking with things in order to split their value. And I just don't do it. And I, I'm very upset at myself for this. And this is why I say I don't deserve to win the best of three, because plays like this are so fundamentally flawed. Anyway, I do this, and they have Lissandra's Entomb. Who could have thought? Uh, I do say one of my other thoughts is... Uh, that you might not want to get rid of their board. You can argue that you're not supposed to attack so you don't let them have board space and just play even more defensively. That way they can't play Kiss Cutie. But Kiss Cutie and Entomb are literally the same possibility of chances in their hand because of cards like uh, Sunken Temple, you can't really make hand reads anymore. So they're both two copies, both two copies of Lissandra's Entomb and two copies of Kiss Cutie. So that sort of logic doesn't really hold too much. It's the same sort of percentage as you're playing around and this puts me in a way favorable position uh, if they don't have Entomb. Keep in mind, they've also played their Harsh Winds and their Three Sisters, so they would literally have to have Entomb, I think, is one of their few cards they could have in this instance. But I just I just misplay like crazy, right? It's so it's so sad that this happens. Because it's it's entirely my fault, right? Just imagine the world where this is here and this is here. Either Victor has died, or I have like traded in extremely well into everything. And that just would feel amazing. And I know Nas and um, and Dolment were watching this live because I have to turn my spectate on for Pink Ghost to be able to see what's going on and to, to adjudicate things. And they were very upset at this play, uh, just as much as I, I think. Um, anyway, the game still goes on. We develop units. I move things around. I'm going to be skipping this a little bit. I need to block in certain ways to prevent Victor. But again, they're at 20 health again. They play Alaskala. I end up drawing... Oh no, sorry, that's the Sejuani. So Sejuani is still in the Entomb, right? Like, keep in mind, this isn't fully, fully over. Uh, I pre-commit Tusk Speaker to try and make the attack better. They double Avalanche, which hurts a little. Uh, I equip uh, this unit with Combat Reel. They end up having the third... I think this is the third Howling Gale? Yeah. No. Y yes? I don't remember if this is the second or the third. Uh, this is another thing that Nas pointed out. They said you should have equipped the Sejuani with the with the unit, with the thing. Uh, I don't entirely disagree. I don't personally have the hand read that they have um, Howling Gale based on the, the Avalanche. They believe that you wouldn't ever Avalanche in this position unless you had Howling Gale. Uh, I disagree. I think you really want to get rid of board units. I think it's very fine to do Avalanche there, especially because all your stuff is tough. But you can say equip this to defeat Howling Gale. I don't think that's an awful argument. The only concern is like, I'm not really going to be attacking with Sejuani if I want to play around Howling Gale. Uh, just because they're going to block with Flamecaller Caprine and then just kill my units anyway and then I lose. So like, I don't know if I'm allowed to attack with Sejuani if I want to beat Howling Gale. And so if they don't have Howling Gale, I'd rather equip Combat Reel onto something else so I'm threatening more damage. And maybe that's something else should have been the Overwhelm unit. But... Yeah, look, at this point I'm talking about like I've got a I've got like a less than that's not the less than symbol. I've got a less than five percent chance of winning the video game. It's probably more like around like zero point two percent chance of winning the video game, just because I'm not threatening lethal on this turn too effectively. If I wanted to play for that 0.2%, you can argue that some of that percentage is going to be doing combat reel on this unit, trying to play for a gangplank top deck, hoping that they don't draw the requisite amounts of burn go for it that way. I don't think that's an awful argument. I'm fearful that they're going to get Challenger really fucking soon, and I have to worry about that. Or, or any other sort of keyword that makes them be defensive here. I don't hate putting Howling Gale on Sejuani. I think Howling Gale on Sejuani is probably correct. I'm just trying to make myself feel better by not saying that. Is possibly the case. Because splitting the damage by putting this on this to set up for an attack doesn't really matter, especially because they're almost certainly blocking Flame Caller Capri in this way. Um, so I definitely agree that like the unit that I put Hal uh, Combat Reel on was definitely the worst one. 
And if this had two health, this would be even better and more of a reason to put it on these units. I kind of still think maybe putting it on this is better. But putting on the, it, this also plays around Divine Whirlwind, right? They can block with this Flame Caller Caprine and then I need to go in for to beat Divine Whirlwind. So, you know what? Nas is probably correct. I'm supposed to put it on this. Not necessarily to play around Howling Gale. I think that's like, while true, if they have Howling Gale, I think I've lost the video game anyway, almost certainly. I'd have to play for a Gangplank top deck and hope. Hope that somehow they haven't drawn their Kisser Cutie or any other piece of interaction, because at this point, their deck is good enough to be able to beat me with most things, whether it be Victor's Death Ray, whether it be another Lissandra, whether it be the Kisser Cutie summoning big units that I can't interact with and so forth. Um, but Nas is probably right that I'm supposed to put it on the Sichuani so that uh, I can play for the Gangplank top deck. Anyway, this is game. Game's over. Uh, what did we learn? Very little, I think, is the unfortunate answer. Uh, I definitely misplayed a lot. I think, you know, we can scrub through this game again, because there was a lot in this game. This was about 22 minutes of gameplay. Uh, oh, we probably started around here. Maybe 20 minutes of gameplay. Uh, part of it was this mulligan, right? Go back to this mulligan. I kept parlay and gangplank. These are cards that, in retrospect, I don't think I'm supposed to keep. Gangplank is a high power card, and I think if they don't draw as well, like they don't draw Mayim into Mystic Shot, Gangplank will feel a lot better because I'm going to get that plunder proc early and spamming Gangplank on curve will feel amazing. And I do spam Gangplank on curve, but for slightly different reasons. But replacing this with Omen Hawk or replacing this with Jagged Butcher, replacing this with Warning Shot would have felt so much better. Same with Parlay. I do end up parlaying the Nexus just for a, a sporadic plunder proc, but a unit is the same thing as a sporadic plunder proc against a deck that doesn't really deal with units too effectively. And so is just a plunder proc, right? It's either a side grade or a downgrade to all the other cards in my deck. If we go through the game, you know, repeatedly tag through it, they end up setting up a victor really early and getting some good keywords on it. This Lissandra stays around on the field for way too long. The Gangplank misplay was quite bad. The Sejuani misplay was quite bad. I, I don't... I don't play very well in this game, and I'm not... I, I get what I deserve, basically, in that I lose uh, for this game. But there's still not. We, there's a game two for this, and so let's go through it. They play this Shen Renekton, and I recorded the, the deck, you know, I recorded the intro to this yesterday, so I don't fully remember what's in this deck. It's been three days since these games. Uh, but what I do remember is that there's no strike spells and no pieces of interaction. Now, I do a misplay in this game as well. Uh, it is a less big. This misplay is not as big, and in fact, at the end of the day, it actually might not be a misplay. I thought it was a misplay at the moment, but seeing how my hand was, it's almost certainly not a misplay anymore. Uh, but let's let's go through this game. All right. Uh, do I keep Vikrash? Let's see. Okay, no. I cut all these cards. So what am I looking for? I am looking for a few things. I'm looking for Mirai Water. I'm looking for Nilla. Right? These are good turn two plays that allow me to be aggressive. Uh, I think I'm probably supposed to keep Pytos. I don't realize that, like, killing Vestayan Disciple is probably quite good for me. So I'm probably supposed to keep Pytos. I'm just, I haven't done this matchup before, so I'm not too sure. I, I've barely played my own deck, let alone played against this deck. So I'm not entirely sure what I should be keeping or, or playing for too much. But I think I'm supposed to keep Pytos. But what I really want to look for is Nilla. I want to look for Tide Dancer specifically. Like, Tide Dancer is a great way of beating them when they can't kill it. They don't have strike spells, so the only way they can kill it is via Vulnerable on an, on an attack token. Uh, and... You know, they can kill it on attack token 6, but we've played after the attack token or just played on attack token 7. Like, they can't interact with the Tide Dancer. It's just not in their deck to be able to do that. So, like, Fulligan for Tide Dancer is pretty nice. Also looking for Portal Palooza or um, Portal Impact Friend, Portal Scholar, uh, is sort of what you want, right? Just developing board, having good units, right? If I ever draw, like, a 3-3 or a 3-4, or God forbid, a 3-mana 4-4 four, four block elusives, I'm going to be so happy, and right, you get that via portals. Alright, we end up drawing... Uh, let's do this thing. We end up drawing pretty well. Uh, we draw the Tide Dancer, which is pretty important. It's going to be how we end up winning the video game. We draw this, which allows us to interact with Vestayan Disciple, which is quite nice, and we end up drawing Nilla, which is great. Turn 2 play, they can't really block it. Fantastic. Uh, they play Vestayan Disciple, we do Pytos. I should have kept it in hand, but whatever, we drew it again. Uh, but was a mul was a Miss Mulligan to kick that from hand because that Vestine Disciple is sort of important for them. Uh, we attack with Nilla. They play Renekton. And this is where I think I thought that I had misplayed, but I had not. We play Pull Shark last turn and we draw something. I think it's okay to play Pull Shark. I don't think it's too punishing to have drawn too many things in my deck. Most things I'm going to be able to play this turn or it's Tide Dancer, which just gets revealed. 
Um, Vic Rush is maybe one of the worst things we could have drawn, but so be it, right? Maybe Slipstream, we could argue, is another bad thing to have drawn, but it, it, it's much ado about nothing, I think. I think you're allowed to play Pool Shark there, and it's pretty okay, especially because you want to be drawing things at all and interacting with the board at some capacity. Anyway, I think that the misplay is that I play Vic Rush, and it means that I can't kill Renekton via uh, these two spells, right? I was thinking that if they wanted to pull Nilla with, like, a, a Ruthless Predator or something, I would want to have done... Uh, these two cards in order to kill gang uh, Renekton. Uh, being able to get this up to four strength and then this doing the fifth damage is, I thought was important. Uh, I, I hurt myself a lot about this play in the commentary. I'm like, God, I can't believe I played Vic Rash. What a useless play. I think I was still thinking that my win con was going to be Swarm. Like, try and find my Portal Scholars. Like, use Biggle Dust to try and win the video game. I'm pretty sure... As soon as I see Tide Dancer against a deck that has no way of killing the Tide Dancer or silencing it or anything was just to say I'm going to play Tide Dancer on 7 and win the video game or pressure enough such that that is the case. Now, I don't necessarily win the video game on turn 7 if they have something like double quicksand or even a single quicksand on some game states if I'm not pressuring early enough. And Renekton striking like three times, like their third attack token with Renekton will be turn 8, which means I could lose if I don't draw Wallop or if I have Wallop and they've got Deny, I still might not win. So you could argue that I'm supposed to not play Vic Rash anyway, so that I'm still holding these cards so that I can kill Renekton just in case. But the counterpoint to that is that I don't actually have a guaranteed kill on Renekton because if they end up doing something like Exhaust, I can't kill Renekton this turn, right? Renekton just doesn't die. So to recap all I've said, because I think I'm getting a little bit rambly. I rile myself up for playing Vic Rash the Exuby, thinking that if they play, if they try and pull this with Renekton, right, I might be scared of something like around a turn eight lethal with Renekton. I shouldn't be as concerned as I am because I should be able to say it doesn't matter if I'm trading into Renekton right now for I am winning on turn seven most of the time via the Tide Dancer. It's hard for me not to win on turn seven with the Tide Dancer. There are worlds in which I don't win on turn 7 with the Tide Dancer, and in those worlds, you could argue that I'm trying to make sure that I kill Renekton right now with these cards and not play Vic Rush, because Vic Rush and killing Renekton are mutually exclusive. But killing Renekton is not guaranteed right now. You can say, if you want, that I'm supposed to pass, because if they play Glaive, then I have a guaranteed kill on Renekton if he attacks. I think if they play Glaive and I pass, they have a world in which they pass back, and if they play Glaive, I can still argue that I'm trying to do a Tide Dancer win con, and I shouldn't be as worried uh, as I am about the Renekton. It's close. The fundamental like tenet here, like like the main core issue, is is the Tide Dancer win con reliable enough on turn seven, or do I need to worry about Renekton? I don't know the answer to this question, and you shouldn't either, because we have not scrimmed this, right? You might have a theory in your head, but this is like literally the question you ask in scrims. Like this is the whole point of scrimming matchups. When are threats necessary? What do I need to worry about in terms of threatening my own win cons and interacting with their win cons, right? Without having done this matchup before, I've never fought Ioni or Renekton before. I've never fought Renekton no interaction pieces or Ionia no interaction pieces against Tide Dancer. I don't know exactly what I'm doing. But that fundamental question is a thing that I don't know about. I rile myself up because I presume I'm playing wrong, and I don't think of myself as someone that tilts very badly, but there's a good chance that I was uh, unfortunately a little bit uh, acute or obtuse or some other sort of angle uh, because of what I did in the last game. But I end up playing Vic Rash. This is a long explanation, but uh, I hurt myself because I played Vic Rash. They end up doing this, and I, I make myself angry for not playing for these sort of defensive cards against uh, this because I was scared that Renekton's going to go out of control. Should be in mind, I don't think I know they don't have William of Ionia yet. Um, I know they don't have any strike spells, but I think I, I, I haven't fully understood that they don't have interaction. I just know their interaction is few, but I, I don't think I've fully known by this point that they don't have interaction. Alright, I let Renekton hit me. I play Pool Shark. I draw some cards. By the time I get the second Tide Dancer, a lot has changed. The lethal on turn 7 is extremely likely if they don't kill Tide Dancer on turn six. And I can just pass forever and burn their attack token if I want to, which burns a lot of mana, which means Renekton's probably not threatening me on turn eight, right? And if they attack me on turn six, then I get to play Tide Dancer and be more likely to win on turn seven, right? Now, Tubble Tide Dancer is not a guaranteed lethal if they've got exactly two quicksand, but I think that is literally the only way they beat Double Tide Dancer, except maybe, maybe like, 
triple twin or double twin defensively, right? Especially because I can get rid of one of their brash blockers. Spoilers, Nilla does level up by the time we attack because we got slipstreams and we got all this stuff. But, you know, in theory they could have had extra brash blockers, but we still get to interact it with, with this. So we don't have to worry too much. Play slipstream. Uh, I attack with Vikrash for two here. This is a sort of a short play. I'm trying to trying to bait them into playing quicksand. Uh, I think if I wanted to really bait them into playing quicksand, I should have played the second Vikrash, but I also wanted to make sure that I had units on field. Um, like, I wanted to make sure I'm six wide by the time we do the tight dance. If I'm one less wide, that's like minus seven damage, right? So I kind of wanted to bait them into doing quicksand, but if I wanted to bait them even harder, I could have played second Vikrash. I think there's a push and a pull about whether you want to do it. I think you can play second Vikrash if you want. Uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. That's the wrong order. Uh, yeah, I, I should have done Slipstream and, and probably played second Vikrash. I think getting the quicksand out of them would have been enough, and I'm probably drawing enough units anyway over the next couple of turns. Uh, so it should have been fine. But... Anyway, it, it's not a big play, but the extra damage can matter if they've got double quicksand or multiple twins and quicksand, but it, it should be much to do about nothing. Uh, they play a couple of cards. It's not too critical. They attack here. This attack I want to analyze a little bit, because um, this is a big thing about Shardox's deck. Let's find a time limit. Okay. This is threatening eight damage. Their deck runs a bunch of sonic waves which is uh, three mana plus two strength. And they also run a bunch of twin. My face might be covering this, so I'm gonna write it here. Uh, two mana plus three damage, right? They've got eight mana, meaning that if they've got two of these or two of these and one of these, uh, they can threaten lethal. Now, they didn't threaten lethal, but let's say I block with this and this, right? Um, which I end up doing, right? I am currently at 10 health, right? I'm 10 away from dying. With their mana, they can afford... Let's get rid of everything on the field. It's it's very overwhelming. Uh, hold on. Uh, with everything they've got, they're, they're trying to deal 10 damage. If they wanted to play like 3 times twin, it would only be plus 9, which wouldn't be lethal, and it would cost 6 mana. But add a Ruthless Predator in... And I have lost. Like, I lose the video game to triple twin Ruthless Predator. That is an unlikely hand. Do not get me wrong. I also sort of lose to double Ruthless Predator plus double twin, although I do have this defensively, so it's not too big of a concern. Um, I could have lost by blocking, right? You can say that I lo that I could have lost by blocking. That's not an awful argument, especially if I'm trying to threaten lethal over the next couple of turns, right? Like, if I'm saying that I'm pretty close to getting lethal, there's really no reason to have done blocks like this. I think that it... It's hard for me to say it's objectively correct not to block. Because the world in which they've got double quicksand is a world where they survive, and I would be very scared of having four health against a leveled Renekton if they've got quicksand. So I think, like, the percentages of their hands where they've got double quicksand and then can follow it up with multiple combat tricks in order to make it such that Renekton is threatening lethal on the next turn uh, is is not as high. Now, Renekton will be threatening a lot of damage on the next turn, right? Renekton will be flipped by the end of this, and if they have any form of vulnerable, they can pull Kennen. Renekton will be a 10-10. Uh, well, it doesn't matter what the health is. Uh, and then plus whatever keywords they get on this or whatever they get off the lucky find, it is going to be quite good at threatening lethal. I think that the only thing I would want you to keep in mind is that if they've got the double quicksand and then are able to threaten lethal on the next turn, there is a non-zero chance that I'm going to be able to kill Renekton on the block with the double Nilla spells that I'm getting from the the Tide Dancers plus Heroic Refrain or, 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 uh, or interaction pieces from, like, I guess Pytos doesn't count because it's got tough. Uh, I think I think there are worlds where I'm able to kill Renekton if they do the double quicksand line. Renekton flips. Very, very big. They end up taking strength, which means that if they have the attack token on eight, they will be able to win the video game. We've got the double Tide Dancer, and there's a bit of logic here regarding how I want to play around things. 
I don't think critically during this. I know this is a story for today. I don't think critically. Uh, regarding what spells I want to use to level up both Tide Dancers, right? I have got four mana, and I want one of those plays to be Slipstream. That's not Slipstream, that's Formless Blade. I want one of these plays to be Slipstream in order to level Nilla. Nilla does two damage to the Nexus and gets rid of this as a Fearsome Blocker and puts Renekton down to five health with Tough, which is nice to be at, especially because all of my units will be dealing either six damage or five damage, right? Six damage from two buffs or five damage from one buff, which means plus any Formless Blade kills Renekton. And that is a good place for me to be in, right? Now, I've got a few options on how I want to play around things. If I want, I can try and uh, try and get rid of units so that they're not able to block as much if they've got quicksand. But I'm not going to be able to get rid of more than three units, right? These are my unit removing tools. And using those... Actually, two units, right? Sorry, this is not a Pytos. This is a Perilous Patriot. Can I get rid of two units, which means if they have quicksand... They're blocking everything anyway, right? Like, these units aren't getting blocked without quicksand. Uh, four into four means it'll be fine, right? Uh, like, the way they're going to use quicksand is by letting themselves block with two things that aren't Renekton. So unless they have double quicksand, getting rid of extra blockers doesn't matter. There's always one unit that's not blocking here, right? You can argue that I am supposed to Pytos this unit. It is one of the few units that if they have a Twin Disciplines does change the healing numbers for combat, right? It's not just going to block one of my units, say, you know, Nilla dealing seven damage. Uh, it'll actually make it so Nilla only does five damage because this unit heals up. So you can argue that that's one of the things I'm supposed to do. You can also argue that I'm supposed to spam Formless Blades on Renekton so that it is easier to kill him. Uh, I don't think the numbers line up exactly, uh, but that is one of the things you can possibly say. Another thing I've just realized is that if you really want to play around... No, that doesn't... I was going to say you can play around cards by killing your own cannon so that Renekton can't kill on turn 8, but because they got plus 2 strength on their thing, it doesn't actually count. I end up deciding to go for Slipstream to level up the Nilla, right? That's one of the things that I wanted to do, and we can go to that case right now, right? We play Slipstream now, I've drawn Pool Shark and another Heroic Refrain. Uh, can I get into a state? Yeah, okay, sure, we can look at this. I end up deciding to shoot this unit... I don't know why. It doesn't change anything. I think I know that by turn 8, I will have wanted this unit to be dead, right? But I don't... The only thing that's playing around is, like, double um, Sonic Wave, right? Or double Vulnerable Pulls, so that they can do that one extra damage. But I'm losing next turn if I... If I don't have a way of killing Renekton, right? So I shouldn't be too worried about... Pytossing this unit, right? I should really just be thinking about pushing in the most damage and trying to win the video game. So I think the correct answer is to Pytoss this, right? If they want to pre-commit a twin to defend it, then it's not going to be able to block and they're going to have to pre-commit more stuff, right? And so I, I think I should have shot this unit, right? I think it's I think it's just me not understanding how the math lines up because it's really hard to do all this tie dancer math in your head. I'm not telling you how much damage is going to the Nexus because I don't know right now yet. All right. I do this, I end up playing Formless Blade to get rid of some damage on the Renekton, being able to threaten the next bit of Formless Blade if I want to. Uh, they do twin defensively, but the numbers line up, I still win the video game. Right, they didn't have Exhaust, oh sorry, they didn't have um, Quicksand. Exhaust is another card they could have had, but they, they did not. And if they had Exhaust, I'm pretty sure this was dealing exactly 20 damage. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if they had exhaust, it wouldn't have changed anything, but I should have shot the the unit anyway. For if they have uh if they have quicksand here, uh I don't think I'm winning, right? They quicksand this unit. Um and then they block this with Renekton such that Formless Blade uh isn't able to kill, right? They put the other minus one on this so that Renekton has two health. Then Formless Blade is not able to kill that unit. And they're not dying, and I lose, right? But if I am able to destroy the lifesteal unit, I can put a little bit more damage on. Um, I don't think that should matter too, too much, because they can always twin something, right? If their hand is quicksand twin, I don't think I'm ever winning the video game. But they don't end up having quicksand. Uh, so I, I end up winning the video game. I think this game isn't the cleanest. I, I remember it being a little bit cleaner in the end game when it happened, but I don't think I fully realized just how close I was to losing this game. Uh, and 
it goes back to that like turn four, should I have tried to threaten Renekton, right? In a position like this, if they ended up having quicksand, I would have lost, right? Unless I draw into my uh, my wallop, right? And I have some capacity of drawing into my wallop. I might play pool shark this turn, try and get into my my slipstreams. They're obviously running copies of deny, so it's not guaranteed. But I, the game wasn't over over because I do have access to wallop. But this does go back to turn four. I could have tried to pass more to try and threaten Renekton. And if Renekton isn't alive right now, it is very hard for them to win the video game. Because I'd still be at quite a high health total and one Renekton would not be enough. Or one Renekton swing is not enough to win the video game. Uh, but that's this game. Uh, I don't know if I have any like big revelations or, or large points I want to bring up about this game. Uh, we do go to a game three. Because uh, this is quite a long set. We play for quite a bit, but... Um... Both a lot goes on and not a lot goes on, right? Like, at the end of the day, I win because I had double Tide Dancer and they didn't have a Quicksand, and you can sort of be reductive of this game to that extent. Um, I definitely don't play perfectly. There's a lot of, like, minor tweaks I could have done better, but for something like my sixth or seventh time playing my deck against a deck I've never fought before, I don't feel too awful. This is sort of my my own benchmark for my, my gameplay skills for this sort of deck. Unlike Plunder, where I'm, like, Mastery 5 on those champions pretty much solely from those champions, right? Uh, I guess I did a little bit of Gwen Sejuani and a little bit of, like, Pirates with Gangplank in it. Um, but... Not a lot. Um, so, like, I hold myself up to a little bit of a higher standard with those decks. But, anyway. Let's go on to Game 3. Uh, game 3, I also misplay in. Uh, and it's a game-losing misplay. Or a game... A, a misplay that could have made me lose the game. I'm not going to spoil if I lose or not. Uh, I just know that I'm disappointed in what I do with this game. But let's go through it. It's Plunder versus the non-interaction deck. But man, oh man. What's the mulligan? All right. Uh, I would like the mulligan like this. Thank you. There. Okay, I fucking love Parley. Um, now, this is a good matchup for Parley. Don't get me wrong. If I get to kill the Stein Disciple, I am pogging. If I get to kill Eye of the Dragon's Dragonlings, I am once again pogging. Uh... I like Shell Shocker. I don't really like Make It Rain as that's Raven. Make It Rain isn't bad, but I already have Parley. If I didn't have Parley, I'd probably keep Make It Rain as a way of interacting with that card, but I already have one of them. I don't need to. I just want to find things like Mirai Warden, like especially Mirai Warden. I want to find things like, you know, Piltover and Castaway on turn three doesn't seem too bad. I want to find things like Unleashed Spirits. I want to find my champions. And so I'm getting these away, I think is fine. And I'm finding Unleashed Spirits as well as the double Shell Shocker opener, which Pog, very, very good. We tack on one, they don't have a two drop. Uh... And this is a short decision I have to make. You can open attack for four, and they don't really have interaction, right? It's exhaust, and I don't know why I'm writing this down. It doesn't really matter. It's exhaust, or it is a uh, quicksand. I'm going to be honest. If either of those cards come down, I'm kind of happy, right? Exhaust is going to always be minus two damage, but doing it on a turn that doesn't deny me a plunder proc is fine, and it doesn't. they're not going to interact with my units with it as well, right? Uh, if it's quicksand, that's great. Four mana... D re prevent two damage if it's like exhaust plus quicksand holy shit i'm pogging right i still have make it rain i can still hit the nexus um also if they spent all that mana i can play unleash spirits uh, pretty effectively one question you could ask is do you want to play unleash spirits before combat right Unleash spirits before combat adds two damage and lets these things have three strength which lets you trade into them better uh my thinking was that on turn four they probably want to play a 4-drop, like shen or renekton and they can't deny unleash spirits if they play a 4-drop uh, so that could be one reason to be wanting to play uh, Only Spirits next turn as opposed to this turn, right? Because I'm almost certainly getting it through next turn, or they're not playing a 4-drop, which makes me feel quite happy. While if I play it this turn and they deny it, it, it kind of hurts, because I kind of like having stats. It seems kind of good against this deck. Uh, so I just go in for my 4 damage. Now, we're going to talk about this in 2 turns time, because there are some things you could say that maybe I should have played uh, the Spirits this turn for a slightly different reason, which we'll talk about in 2 turns. They end up playing Exhaust, by the way, which is great, fine for me. They play Shen, I play only Spirits, they play Galave, uh, they attack, they get Overwhelm. I don't decide to block because I want to have my units. That's fine. On turn 5, I play Gangplank, uh, which is very big. And then they play uh, the Sign Disciple, I play Nopify, and... I don't play Nopify. I'd like to clarify. I do not play Nopify. Uh, I play Make It Rain. They Nopify my Make It Rain, which means Gangplank is not flipped. This is what I was talking about. If we go back to this turn, uh, turn three, if I play Unleash Spirits this turn uh, and they deny it, right, I will have one mana banked, right? 
We go into this turn here. Uh, they play Shen. They play Glaive whatever, right? I play uh, Make It Rain on this turn. Uh, and then I play Parlay on this turn. Um, I guess they're still denying it. For some reason, I thought this would guarantee a Gangplank level up. It does not. Uh, it does not guarantee the Gangplank level up if this happens. Because they can always nopify this spell anyway. Sorry, for some reason, I thought I had a Gangplank level up. My bad. Uh, ignore all of this. Um, my thinking was that I would be playing two spells on this turn and they can only get rid of one, but it means I'm not procking Plunder on the, on the other turn. Uh, yeah, the mana doesn't align the way that I thought it did. That's okay. Uh, anyway. They deny this. I decide not to attack with Gangplank. Uh, my thinking was that if they had a something like a twin, I'd be kind of sad, right? Like, Gangplank just trades into them and, and it sucks. So do they have another Vestine Disciple? Is that why I'm sort of confused? Yeah, okay. Sorry. Um... Oh no, this is the same one. They denied it. I, I, I am desperately tired. I do apologize. Uh, I don't attack here because if they've got twin, I'll lose my Gangplank for no reason. I wanted him to be flipped. He does two damage to everything and they can't really kill Gangplank unless they challenge him to the side, which is possible, but not the most likely thing in the world. Um, we open, they play Sonic Wave and kill this unit. This Sonic Wave is interesting. It tells me that they want to keep their Shen alive quite badly. Because uh, otherwise you would pull Gangplank here, right? Now, I could have Make It Rain and level up Gangplank, but it means that they don't have something like a twin that allows it to trade positively or whatever, right? Um, they do that. I end up not doing Make It Rain. I just end up playing, I think... Yeah, I do this on the Nexus. That allows me to play Ardnaki Kibaros this turn into Sejuani. I don't really want to parlay anything else, so it's all very fine by me. I do I have Naka Kibaros, and then I play Sejuani next turn. I pull the Shen... Everything is poggers. They end up doing quite a few things. So this is an interesting turn with their cards and their options and their way of trying to win. Remember that our health is not the highest, right? They did end up pulling a unit with one health with their overwhelm unit and buffing something up with the sonic wave such that the, the Vestine Disciple had three strength. So like we are somewhat threatened. Uh, I pull the, the Shen this way. They end up having uh, quicksand. So they end up getting rid of the... Uh, the overwhelm over these units and they end up trying to keep this unit back now i thought it's because they had deny for powerful explosion uh and they just wanted to keep this unit around right no reason to have it lose um and they're probably dead on my next attack token so like keeping their unit around to try and find more things or to have that as a possible win con is what they need like they need the elusive damage to try and win the video game uh they end up doing twin to protect this for Stein disciple game goes through and this is the game losing misplay. I don't parlay this Eye of the Dragon. Why is this a game losing misplay? Because they're gonna have three units. And if Make It Rain gets like, you know, doesn't hit the Nexus or this, because they play another unit and they deny parlay or something, I lose, right? And I lose if they've got like a bunch of twins or something on this first Dying Disciple. We get into this position here. And if they have two Sonic Waves, or a Sonic Wave and a Design Disciple, or something like that, um, I I can get a little bit scared if Make It Rain doesn't hit uh, the Nexus and they have protection for the Stein Disciple, because it's going to hit either the Stein Disciple or the Nexus, that's guaranteed. Or if they develop a unit and they have interaction for the Parley, right? Those are the, those are the possible circumstances. It is quite likely that I don't die here, right? They need to have enough buff spells... Make It Rain is going to hit either the unit that's threatening lethal or the Nexus. Um, so they need to either have protection for either of those, like a Deny with all of those spells that are threatening lethal, which is possible with Deny plus Sonic Wave plus Twin. Or protect the, the monkey, and it's going to try and hit the monkey, so they would have to have like two twins, and like second and third twin, we already saw a twin, as well as the Sonic Wave. They could also have Payday as one of their cards, right? Payday is able to give strength or health, and Payday is able to give spell shield, right? There's a few cards that they could have here. While if I had just parlayed the Eye of the Dragon, uh, that becomes a lot less likely because they need to spend that mana on that health uh, like more more reliably, right? Um, or if I make it rain, if I if sorry if I parlay this, they need to literally just make it so it doesn't hit the Nexus, right? Because it's always going to hit the Nexus if I parlay this unit, right? That's more important, right? They have to literally have deny, as opposed to having multiple copies of protection spells, which they have like three paydays and you know all that sort of stuff. 
they go in for the attack. They've got Resonating Strike. They have another Resonating Strike. I do make it rain. It hits the Nexus. They don't have Nopify. I win the video game. We won. We won 2-1. Did I deserve to win 2-1? Absolutely not. Uh, but we did anyway. Uh, so... End of the day, what did we learn from these matchups? Fucking, I don't know. I misplay less. Think about it. Think about the game more. Uh, a lot of my misplays come down, as I said to the side of this, like me identifying the threats, but not properly identifying the way to beat those threats, which is a bit sad because I felt like that was something that I was doing okay with. Like, uh, it, it's very strange to me that I fucked up the Entomb play because it's something that I've been doing correctly for years. Um, but so be it. Uh, we also learned that bringing linearly good decks against decks that aren't linearly good sometimes is good enough to win video games. Um, that that's mostly it. You know, you can mulligan better. A lot of the mulligans here were different. I don't think there's a big theme for this outside of those. A lot of these were just like incidental minor plays regarding certain things like the Renekton or the Tide Dancer and, you know, whether to keep things in the mulligan and what to do with your champions and all these sorts of things. Uh, but that's it. There was a lot of talk about the games this time because the games were rather long, right? There was like 40 minutes of gameplay. I don't know how long this recording is. An hour? Yeah, like there's an hour of us talking about the uh, the games and only like 15 minutes for the intro. Uh, but that's that's CDS for this week. Next week, again, we're fighting Sir Termond. Uh, Standings-wise, there should be four players... No, there should be five players, I think, that are five and... that are four and two. And we're one of the four and twos, but there are five players four and two. Uh, we have the second most points tied with two other players. I think it might be Shardox and Sir Termond that we're tied with. The Cephalopod has the most points, and Margin Bay has one less point than everyone else, but also four and two. Uh, so it's becoming quite a tight competition for the final couple of slots. We're probably... We're not guaranteed in finals, I think, but we're almost certainly in finals. Um, if we lose our next three games, we're going to be four and five. And I think... Four and five still make it into finals if they've got a good enough score. And with the way that points have gone out, it shouldn't be too difficult because the top six gets into finals. But I really want to get the top two so I miss out on one game, right? Because four players, you know, seeds three through six play in the prelim finals, then the semifinals at, you know, first and second fighting the winner of three through six. And the grand finals is the winner of those two matches playing each other. And so I'd like to get first or second. That'd be quite nice. But that means we're going to actually have to beat, you know, we're probably going to have to go 3-0 the last couple of weeks, because I presume Cephalopod, or at least one of these other players, is going to go 3-0 that's also 4-2, right? Uh, so, anyway. That was me rambling. I didn't have any water during this. I should have. Hope you enjoyed, and I shall see you next week for more um, Spids YouTube VOD review CDS nonsense. Bye.